for their trial that is useful. Verses 13, 13 and 14. You acted foolishly, Pharaoh said. You have not kept the commandments the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would not establish your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has thought out a man after his own heart, appointed him leader of the people, because you have not kept the Lord's commandments. Verses 15, 22, 23. When all the Israelites who had hidden in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were on the run, they joined the battle in hot pursuit. So the Lord, Lord rescued Merle. Israel that day and the battle moved on. Merle is not on the right one. I'm sorry. 15, 22, 23. 15, 22, 23. That's all right. I'll get you on the map. Yeah, okay. 15. Am I on? There we go. Thank you, Merle. We had a lot of them. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, we just praise you for your goodness, for your faithfulness. Help us not to see through men's eyes, but help us to see through your eyes, Lord, to have a pure heart, to pursue you with our hearts, to love one another as you loved when you gave Jesus. Lord, that you were faithful and true to all of your covenants, to all of your words, Father. And they're still just as true today as they ever were. Bless this service today. Open our hearts and our minds and have your spirit come upon us and lead us in the direction that we should go, that we may bring glory and honor to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I need my sermon notes. I don't want to wing it this much. So today is called the faithfulness of God. And if you were here last week, we talked about Masada a little bit. It comes from the Hebrew word Metsuda, which means fortress, defense, or stronghold. And we talked about the Jewish zealots who were zealous for God, but yet put their faith into this rock, literal rock on earth. This defense position that looked like, hey, this is a good place to be but that putting your faith into creations is the wrong way to go. That we can only put our faith in the Creator. 
And we talked about the fact that David may have found this same place when he was hiding from Saul and he went. And the scriptures talk about him finding this fortress, this hiding place. But God called him out of that hiding place. He said, don't stay there. You are to put your faith and trust in me, not in things, but in the Creator, in your God. And he did. He came out and put his faith in God for protection. And God blessed him and blessed him and blessed him. So Christmas is soon as approaching. And you might think, how does this message have anything to do with Christ, with Jesus? Well, if we didn't have David, we wouldn't have had the Messiah come through him. Because that's one of the promises that God made to this young man, David. That through his lineage would come a Savior. A Savior that would heal all of men's burdens, all of men's sins, once and for all. A Savior that would take their place and do for them the things they never could do. Because David was a good man, but David was a bad man. And doesn't that tell the story of our lives? And we're going to look at that today. The word Advent means in Latin, coming or arrival. And that's what we're doing when we're lighting the candles, when we're celebrating. We're celebrating and remembering the fact that God loved us so much that He keeps His promises that His love does not fail, His faithfulness does not fail. And He sent Jesus Christ. He has came to this earth. He has paid the price for our sins. And it is our responsibility out of love, out of a wholehearted devotion for God, to tell others of the joy that we have in our hearts. Why is God so faithful? Because He's God. It's His attributes. Plain and simple, it's who God is. He will be faithful. He will be loving. He will be kind. But don't forget that He will be the judge also because He is a righteous and holy God. And that's why we have the hope when we do go to heaven, if we believe in Jesus Christ, that there will be no more sin. There will be no more shame. There will be no more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain. Because none of those things come from God. It is not His nature. So He has to judge that. But He doesn't want to judge sin. That's why He loved us so much that Jesus Christ gave up His throne in heaven and came down to be born a man, to be raised by a teenage a young girl, to be totally helpless upon a human being, and then to grow up and be faithful to God and to die for our sins after teaching us how to live. God promised the coming of this Messiah through David, and that's exactly what He did. Was David faithful to God? We're going to look at that today and see just how faithful David was in his life. But God promised, and that's the reason that we have hope. That's the reason we have peace. That's the reason for this season. Jesus is the reason for the season. And don't forget it. We get caught up in family and friends and festivities and food and gifts, and that's all wonderful. But don't forget that Jesus is the reason for the season. And make sure that you reach out in the hands of love to someone else and tell them about Jesus. God made His covenant with Abraham. He said to Abraham that He would be the father of many. And He was talking about of a believing people, not just people. But that He would be the father of a believing nation. That the Messiah would come through Him. And then He made another covenant with David that reassured this. David was called by God a man after his own heart. And we're going to look at that some today. He did listen to God. He came out of the rock, the hiding place, that the Jewish zealots put their faith in. And he came out and he followed God. And God blessed him thoroughly. Isaiah foretells of the Messiah. He tells the descendants of Jacob in Isaiah 7, verse 13 and 14. It says, Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call Him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God carried out His promise all throughout. And this is when the Israelites are saying, demanding a sign. And God says, I am the one that's faithful. You guys obviously aren't. And when we look back through the Bible, we say, how could they follow God one minute and then the next minute turn to idolatry? But we do the same things. We don't like pointing fingers at ourselves. It's so much easier to see it in others. But God loves His children and He keeps His covenants. 
He established a covenant with David that would last forever. 2 Samuel tells of that covenant. 2 Samuel 7, verses 8 through 16. Nathan the prophet is telling David, he says, Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pastures, from tending the flocks, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel. And I will plant them so that they come, can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. The de Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I'll keep reading in a second, but if you'll notice, there's a theme here. I am God. I am that I am. Not David by his power. Not Solomon that he's talking about afterwards. And when he says that he will establish his throne forever, he's talking about the coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. I will be his father, talking about Solomon, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul. So he gives David a warning here. Whom I removed before you, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. It wasn't by David's might that he became a mighty king. It was by God's grace, by God's will, by God's design. It wasn't by Solomon's might that he became an even more wealthy, more wise king. It was by God's choice, God's design, God's plan. And both of them kind of forgot about it at times because it's tough when you get a lot of things. You kind of sometimes forget who gave them to you. And we get that in the United States because we are a land of plenty and we forget that God gave us all we have. We expect to wake up in the morning and have freedom. We expect to have a sun shining and oxygen to breathe. But it's only by grace of God that we have that. David was the man who decided to leave the fortress of the earth and follow after his God. He made God his rock and his salvation so that God would save him from all of his enemies. And God did save him from all of his enemies. God did establish him as king. God promised to give him a kingdom that was eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. God did all these things not because of who David is, but because of who God is. God is and was and always will be faithful and does exactly what He says. But do we? Do we follow His words? Do we do what we say we'll do? Do we keep our covenants, our promises? His children always aren't faithful, are they? Many times we lose faith in our behavior, in our words, in our actions. Simply put, we sin. But we don't like to call it that, do we? But that's what it is. We like to make an excuse and say, well, if it wouldn't have been for this or that. Or, yeah, maybe I did this. You did what? Sin? Yes, I sin. I do sin, and I am thankful that I have a God that forgives me of my sins and cleanses me from all unrighteousness through Jesus Christ my Lord. The Jewish zealots didn't remember. They didn't remember the Scriptures, even though they were taught to wear them to meditate on them. They didn't remember that God delivered them from the hand of the Egyptians, from all of their foes that they faced for many years. And that when they turned their backs on God, He was still faithful to them. But He did let consequences of sin take place, did He not? David came out of that fortress and said, I will follow God. And he wrote a psalm, Psalm 18, talking about that. 
Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3 says, For the director of music of David, the servant of the Lord. So we know this one is from David. He sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. This is the David we read about last week. Who saved David? God. Who did everything for God and set him up in his kingship? God. Who protected him from all of his enemies, including the king? And we don't think about that. That was God. But the king was the most feared and respected man of the land. And we saw this morning that the people demanded a king. They demanded a king so they could be like the other pagan lands around. The Israelites didn't need a king. They had the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. They didn't need an earthly king to rule over them. So Saul was either the most loved man, the most hated man, the most respected man, the most feared man, however he decided to treat others under him. You better listen to him. And he decided he wanted to kill David. So David had to run in fear for his life. But God said, come out, I will protect you. And he did. So David writes that psalm and says, You, God, are my strength, my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my refuge, my shield, my horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I have been saved from all of my enemies. He acknowledges that God is the one. Not by his power, but by God's might and God's grace. The book of Samuel was written as a book of history for the Israelites. It was written as one book and then divided out into two books. And at the end of 2 Samuel, you'll find a song in there. And it happens to be Psalm 18. So the people of the land sang this song of David's. It was taught to the people as a song of praise to teach them that God was their rock, their deliverer, their strength. That God would protect them and provide for them and save them. But we'll see that David doesn't always follow through with his words. In 2 Samuel 22, 1 through 3, it says, David sang to the Lord the words of this song, when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my Savior. From violent people you save me. It's changed a little bit. I don't know why it's changed. Maybe it fit the melody a little better, or is that the right word? Or the tune? I don't know music. Whenever they ask me how did that song go, I'm like, I don't know, because I don't know music. But I don't know why it changed here. But what I do know is that David wrote this song when he was delivered. Maybe he wrote it at the time that he first became king. I don't know. It doesn't say anything about him being king. But he was definitely delivered from the hand of Saul. He was delivered from the hand of the Philistines. And when 2 Samuel writ, was written, if it was written in history, that's the next to the two chapters from the end of, of the book. So that's the song that the Israelites sang all during Jake, uh, uh, David's reign and everything. It was a song that told about his life. But today I want to look at his life a little bit more and see what his life did say. Because, you know, it's not about us. We are sinners. It's all about God. God is the one who is faithful. His love endures forever and His covenant stand true for all times. Did David really remember all the words that he wrote after God called him out to be his fortress and his stronghold? Well, let's see what 2 Samuel 11 says. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. 
Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent the word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all of his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, Haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judea are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. This is the same guy that wrote Psalm 18. Doesn't sound like it, does it? What happened between that time? Maybe this morning scripture, you didn't understand what point I was trying to make. So let's go through it again, because it's a history of what happened. A history of what happened to this man. How that if you don't keep your eyes focused on God, that before you realize it, you'll be way far off the path, won't you? We could talk about that story a ton, but we saw a progression of sins, sins that we find atrocious. How could David... A man after God's own heart. A man who said, God is my rock and my fortress, my strength. How could he have that kind of behavior? In 1 Samuel 8, verses 6 and 7, it says, But when they said, that's meaning the Israelites, the same people that were the Jewish zealots, the same people through all throughout history that God had protected, that they had walked through the Red Sea and watched the plagues of Egypt and been delivered from the hand of their enemies time and time again, and they said, give us a king to lead us. Why? God was their king. They didn't need to have a king like the pagan lands did. Why do we look at other people and say, they must have it going good. They're not serving God. Why don't we see the love that God has for us and why is that not enough? Scripture goes on to say, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. Looking back, it's easy to say, how could they do this? But don't we reject our king so many times? When he asks us to do this or that, and we say, I will once I get this done, Lord. Who's king? Who is your rock and who is your fortress? Skipping on to the next passage, 1 Samuel 9.2. It says, Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. Why do you think Scripture says that? Because we look at man's appearances. Oh yeah, he's a handsome, strapping young man. Certainly he's good for the job. In fact, it said he was head taller than anyone else. Not just taller, but a head taller. This was a man's man. Certainly this is the man to lead us as king. In the eyes of men... This makes sense, doesn't it? But God looks at a man's heart, doesn't He? He looks for those that fear Him. Skipping down to verse 15 and 16, it says, Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. God hears our prayers. Whenever we pray, 
they go immediately to heaven before the throne of God. Just because we don't get the answer that we're expecting doesn't mean He doesn't hear us. And He knows what's good. He knows what works according to His purpose. Jesus taught us how to pray. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come and Thy will be done. He's not a vending machine that we put money in and out pops the soda that we choose. It doesn't work that way. But guess what? He has all of our best in mind. He loves us. That's why He made a covenant with David. That's why Jesus Christ came instead of judgment. Jesus Christ came to redeem us by His own blood. 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14 says, You have done a foolish thing, Samuel says. You have not kept the commands the Lord your God gave you. If only Saul would have obeyed God. God would have given the Israelites a king even though that they were rejecting Him. And his, He would have been established in His kingdom, but He rejected God. If you had, you would have, He would have established your kingdom over Israel for all times. But we don't remember Saul that way, do we? But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. He's talking about David, the one we just read about that was a murderer and an adulterer. And appointed him ruler of his people. Why did God do this? Because you have not kept the Lord's commands. Because your heart is not focused on me. See, Saul became king and it went to his head, didn't it? But wait a minute, didn't we read about the same thing with David? Why would the king stay home? Why would the king send out someone to put him on the battle lines to be killed. Because the king had the power and authority to do that. It went to David's head. Do you remember John 4.23? I've mentioned it many times. Jesus was talking at the woman at the well, and he confronts her with her sins. She tries to change the subject. But he asks her if she wants to be saved, if she wants to have living water that will last forever. Living water that only he can offer. And John 4, 23 says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. These are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. It hasn't changed. That's what God has sought from the beginning of creation till Jesus Christ comes back and does judge the earth again. He is seeking those who will truly follow Him, whose heart is committed to Him, who will follow Him wholeheartedly. Does that mean we won't make mistakes? No. We see that from David. It's obvious. Because God did call him a man after his own heart. God did establish his kingdom. It wasn't because anything David did. It wasn't because the words of praise that he gave. It was because God is a faithful and loving God. That just overwhelms me. No matter what I do, God still loves me. I am going to try my best to be a sweet-smelling offering to Him with my life. Have I told Him that I didn't want to be? Many times. Have I said, when I do this, God, I'll do that.